Okay, so clickers will count today. So I did my best, my democratic thing here. So <clears throat> yes, the clicker points will count. This one, however, does not count. You're not going to see it's a zero. No counting for, no counting for that one. So. Um, <clears throat> we had something else on Friday. There are a few more people here on Friday. Uh, looking at the high scores, we're actually 45. There were two of you, and I know who you are. Um, but those are clearly outliers. So it looks as if I'm probably going to be normalizing to 42 or around 42-ish. I only normalize at the very, very end of the term. And that'll also add all the clicker questions to that as well. So um, people have more questions about how I grade. First, take a look at the syllabus, which is where I put it. Um, and then if you still have more questions, let me know. Um, ignore what there is on D2L. That um, is not a decent calculation. OK, so that being said, there were a few questions on the exam that lots of people missed. Um, either they were bad questions, most likely, or I did a bad job of explaining them also distinctly possible. So <clears throat> first one, um, dispersive replication is most similar to which of the following? Base excision repair, homologous recombination, non-homologous end joining, nucleotide excision repair, photolysis, meteor repair. The whole point here is that it's bits and pieces that get copied. And so a little piece on this side, that's like chopping out a little piece and resynthesizing it. So that's what it was supposed to be about. Um, but again, evidently, it wasn't clear, particularly in that particular question. So the next one that I wanted to mention was <clears throat> homologous recombination. And I think this is actually probably, oops, click on here. <clears throat> More important, generally, uh, after a strand invasion, what is the next step in the homologous recombination process? Endonuclease cleavage, rec -A red 51 DNA polymerization, DNA ligation, holiday junction resolution. So, uh, the first thing that happens is exonuclease going from 5 prime to 3 prime. Then strand invasion is this piece coming down and invading the other double strand. What happens next? It's the DNA polymerase. So DNA polymerization is the next step here. Um, we also had some questions about what was happening with holiday junction resolution. Can't see holiday junctions on here, but it's when this strand has hooked up to that strand, and this strand has hooked up to that strand. You then have two holiday junctions. Those, for a standard double-stranded break, if you've got two chromosomes, like you'd have in meiotic recombination, you're always going to have two holiday junctions. And it's a resolution of those two holiday junctions, how they cut, which is going to give you a patch or a crossover. So that, I thought, was an important aspect. Yeah? So based on this mix and match, I, for the previous question, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I understand. I understand the point that you know, homologous recombination would be another way to think about it. But in terms of literally patching, because homologous recombination can also give you that crossing over thing, which is not happening when you have dispersive replication. Yes, it's nitpicky. I agree. <laughs> but unfortunately, some of my exam questions have a tendency to be that way, as you may or may not have noticed. OK, so the last one, and this is, I was, um, should have probably talk more about this as well. According to the animation that we watched in class, how many people watched the animation? How many tuned out in that process? Uh, TF2D binds to which promoter element first while forming a pre-initiation complex? And what TF2D does is it first interacts with this downstream promoter element, the DPE. Um, and that's also, we had that here in this table, you know, DPE, it's TF2D that interacts with this. So, the same complex that also contains the Tata box interacts with all of these other parts. And it seems that that's actually more important that you have TF2D interacting with these other parts of the promoter before it actually interacts with the Tata box. So how critical that is, I'm not entirely sure. But I, since so many people missed it, I thought I would go over it again. So <clears throat> that was, you know, we've done DNA replication, we've done transcription. So these first two things here, replication, repair, transcription. One last step to finally get us proteins. <clears throat>
So today we'll talk about sort of the very basics of translation, and then on Wednesday we'll talk more about some of the specifics on how translation is regulated and particularly how it's initiated. Um, first, however, we need to talk a little bit about the genetic code. Um, fascinating question, is it a frozen accident or is it something which is evolved, something that can't change anymore because once it happened, all cellular life was doing that, and so why would we have this particular genetic code? So there are a couple of potential reasons for that. Open reading frames, or ORFs, um, more alphabet soup. Um, people seem to have lots of issues in the past. I'm sure this class will be completely different um, with open reading frames and what the whole concept of an open reading frame is. Literally, open reading frame is start codon, stop codon, and a stretch of amino acids in between. That's all that an open reading frame is. And if you've got two strands of DNA, you can actually have six open reading frames. So we'll talk about that um, a little bit later on. tRNAs, um, we've mentioned tRNAs really briefly. I think it was one of the questions on the exams, the second most common RNA that you have in the cell. And most people think about tRNAs in terms of cloverleafs. That's a great way to draw them and think about them, but they're actually much more of an L shape, which is, turns out is actually very important on how you get translation to happen. And tRNAs are sort of the, uh, I think it's the, the decoder ring, you know, cracker box decoder rings. How many of you remember these things? How old am I? Um, so basically the whole idea of translation is you're going from a nucleic acid code to a amino acid code. So two completely different languages. And how do you get from one code to the other? Most people would say it's about the tRNAs, but the tRNAs are actually really kind of dumb. Um, it's really much more about the tRNA synthetases, or I should say the amino acyl tRNA synthetases, because there's the ones which put the appropriate amino acid on the tRNA. And the tRNA is just what's used by the ribosome to make your final protein after that. So, and the ribosome, take home message in the ribosome, it's RNA. So yeah, there are a bunch of proteins that are associated with the ribosome as well, but in terms of the actual translation machinery, it's RNA. And a lot of people say this is good evidence that there was an RNA world before there was a DNA world in terms of the evolution of life um, on our planet. And just really quick aside here, any of you know about the show Ancient Aliens on the History Channel? Um, I was actually just asked by a producer to talk to them about viruses, so I'm talking to them at 11 today. We shall see. <laughs> so, I'm not sure I buy the whole thing, but it's education, entertainment, something. We shall see. Let's see. So, with that aside, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about the genetic code, which of course came from outer space, right? No. So, uh, some people would argue that it did, but I completely disagree with them. So. <clears throat> The whole idea of the genetic code, again, is we're going from a nucleotide language to an amino acid language. And way back when, when we talked about chromosomes, there was no way DNA could be the genetic information because it was too boring. It just had four nucleotides. It wasn't sufficient. Um, and you had 20, and actually there are 21 or 22 um, genetically encoded amino acids. We won't get into too much detail about that. But the basic message is how do you go from a four nucleotide language or four letters to something that has 20 letters. And this is just straight mathematics, um, four to the n, so if you had a one nucleotide code, you could only encode for four amino acids. You have two, you can do 16, three gives you 64. Well, that's kind of strange. Why don't we just have 16 amino acids? That would make a lot more sense, wouldn't it? So, but we've got 20, so we need to have more than 16. So. <clears throat> That is what we have, of course, n is equal to three, um, 64 codons. Way, way, way too many. And that's interesting, and that's partly why a lot of people thought that the genetic code you know, could have come from outer space, or was just some kind of accident, it just happened. And those are the code, and the translation of that code has just been maintained. Another really interesting question, and this actually goes back to the fact that DNA is not a terribly efficient code. And again, you know, two meters of DNA inside each of our cells. It would make much more sense from a coding point of view to have an overlapping code. And what 
mean by an overlapping code? This is a little funky to think about. So if you have an overlapping code, for instance here you have an original sequence, AGC, ATCG, an overlapping code you'd have AGC and then GCA, CAT, ATC, TCG. And so this sequence here of seven nucleotides could give us five codons, like five different amino acids, which is actually a pretty efficient way to go. Of course, as hopefully we know, um, it's a non-overlapping code, and that's probably because of what we spent so much time talking about before the last midterm, DNA damage and DNA repair. So if you have a non-overlapping code, then if you have one particular point mutation, say here, this C changes to an A, in an overlapping code, you would change three codons, but in a non-overlapping code, you just change one. And that is probably, again, we don't know, but um, pretty good reason to have a non-overlapping code. And it turns out that there's this really nice paper um, written by, I think it was um, Stephen Brenner, uh, who basically looked at the different amino acids that people had found and just then back calculated that there could not be an overlapping code because of all of the dipeptides. And if you really want a fun exercise, you can go and figure that out, but I don't expect you to do that. So <clears throat> we have a non-overlapping three nucleotide code. <coughs> what does that code look like? And so this is the translated genetic code. No, I don't expect you to remember all of it. Um, just a couple things. Um, the green ones are, think about these, and the red ones are ones that I would know. So green is, for some amino acids, you actually have six different codons that will encode them. Um, turns out that these are really quite common amino acids that have all of these. There are a few that have four, glycine, proline, threonine, valine, also quite common amino acids, alanine over here as well. And then probably, I think it's, I haven't counted, but I think it's about half of them that will just have two. And then the few exceptions. One of them is methionine, also the start codon, AUG, and tryptophan, UUG. Now, why the heck tryptophan? Um, we talked a little bit about tryptophan and the tryptophan structure. The side chain on tryptophan is the most bizarre, complicated, multiple ring structure of any of the amino acids, and probably actually is an amino acid that evolved relatively late in terms of evolution of amino acids and using those individual amino acids. It's also one of the rarest amino acids. So that's probably why it just has a single codon. The other, so this is 61, which I'm sure all of you have counted here. Uh, we've got three leftover codons here at the end. Um, these are the stop codons, and so this is where you end. So we have a way to start, methionine, and a way to stop um, over here. This is the genetic code that we have in our textbook. I much prefer looking at a genetic code in this form because it, I think, gives you a much better idea about potentially why we have 64 codons and only 20 amino acids. So this is just, you know, first letter of the code, I'm sorry, across the top, second letter, third letter of the code, and we'll just take <coughs> methionine, so A, U, G, that's where all of them line up with each other. So um, this is nice because if you look on here, it's also color-coded by the flavor, as I talked about way back at the beginning, of the side chain. Are they hydrophobic? Are they hydrophilic? Are they charged, etc.? So if you look at where the negatively charged amino acids are, they're down here in red, the aspartic acids and the leukamic acids. Lysines and arginines, arginines and lysines are relatively similar to each other in this table form. And what do I mean by being relatively similar to each other in this table form? What this means is you can actually have changes in some of the nucleotides and still end up with a chemically extremely similar amino acid. So this is sort of what's called the degeneracy of the genetic code. You don't actually need all three nucleotides all the time 
to make sure that you have one particular amino acid. And even if you do happen to have a change, because then your DNA repair machinery hasn't caught up or hasn't even fixed that particular nucleotide, you very often are still going to end up even with a similar kind of amino acid, even if it's not exactly the same one. So for instance, we can say we've got here a C-U-G um, and an A-U-G down here. Actually, there's slightly different ones. Let's just use this different one. So C-U-A and A-U-A. So just change one nucleotide. That gives you an isoleucine versus a leucine. That's unlikely to change the structure of your protein in a really major way. So probably the reason that you have a, a degenerate genetic code, and particularly the way it's organized like this, is protection against mutation. So you can have lots of mutations, but that's not going to change the structure of your protein, and structure gives you function. Yeah, I know it's Monday morning, it's snowing. Um, so <clears throat> And that's probably why the genetic code is degenerate in this particular way. Uh, in the textbook, they go really wild about the genetic code being universal. Um, it's almost universal. And most of the changes, actually, interestingly, in the genetic code have to do with reuse of these different stop codons. So sometimes this stop codon, for instance, would be a tryptophan, or this stop codon would be a tyrosine. Um, so that's where we have variability in the genetic code. There are some cases that people have found just in sequencing that maybe is a slightly different use of the genetic code as well. So that's, um, again, probably not that critical. And just again, as an overview, how do you read this? A, U, G, um, end up with methionine. So how do we go about doing this? How does the cell actually translate the genetic code? So this used to be in Greek in a previous version of PowerPoint, so I like the Greek instead. Um, but how did people figure out what the genetic code was? Um, turns out that this was really a great breakthrough in terms of organic chemistry. And it was literally being able to make <coughs> nucleotides, and particularly polynucleotides. And the easiest nucleotide to make wasn't necessarily the one that was most informative, but uracil was really nice. Why uracil? Any ideas why uracil? It's just in RNA, exactly. And so if you want to study something which is RNA important, then you put together this polyuracil. Actually, it turns out it was probably a control for the first experiment that they used. They actually made one of these polynucleotides and threw it into their reaction. And they saw, whoa, we're getting a ton of one particular amino acid out. And it turns out that the original one they did, again, was polyu. If you put polyu together with ribosomes, and you can purify ribosomes, purify ribosomes actually using the centrifugation techniques that we talked about before, something called an S30, the supernate of a 30,000 RPM spin, has a bunch of ribosomes in it. You throw in messenger RNA, you throw in some ATP, and what happens? You get polyphenylalanine. So if you get polyphenylalanine with polyu, what does that mean that that codon is? It's the codon for phenylalanine. U, 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 exactly. And so eventually, by going through this whole process, they figured out all of the codons, actually almost all of the codons, and there were some other mechanisms that were used as well, to eventually figure out the genetic code. And what does this? Again, the little decoder ring. It's the tRNA. But more importantly is that it's not just the tRNA. It's the tRNA that has the appropriate amino acid attached to it. So in this case, um, the tRNA, this now has an anticodon, and anticodons are going to match the codon. So here our codon is 5' UGC, and the anticodon is, <clears throat> and this should actually be the um, GCA. This should be the other way around. I'm actually put the wrong way in this particular figure. So <clears throat> before we talk about tRNAs, I um, just wanted to briefly cover open reading frames. So start codon is always AUG, right? Well, whenever Stedman puts something in quotes, what does he mean? Don't believe it. Uh, so it turns out that in bacteria, and maybe in archaea, although it's a little bit of an open question, you can often start with GUG or UUG. So it's not 
always AUG like you have it in eukaryotic systems. And when we talk about where things start a little bit later on, we'll see why this is. Stop codons in all organisms are either UGA, UAG, or UAA. And we talked about this a little bit before, but nucleic acid sequencing is really easy and really, really cheap. Protein sequencing is way more expensive, as I know we're trying to do protein sequencing in my lab, um, than doing DNA sequencing. So just by doing DNA sequencing and knowing the genetic code, you can actually predict what kind of protein you're going to get. Now, there's one caveat to that, is you have to know where to start. And so this is just an example of three different messenger RNAs, each of which have exactly the same sequence. So this one starts with AUG, this one starts with AUG, this one starts with AUG. But depending on where you start, if you start at this nucleotide, you have an AUG and a whole bunch of amino acids, and then you get this stop codon. So every three amino acids, that would be one reading frame. This will also be known as the plus one open reading frame, because it starts the first nucleotide of your messenger RNA. On the other hand, if you start at plus two, you got a stop codon, you got a couple of amino acids, another stop codon, no start codon to be seen anywhere here. And then if you started at plus two, then there's a whole stretch of amino acids here. No start and no stop, but this could be in the middle of some other coding sequence. And this is just the RNA. If you think about the DNA, there are actually two strands. And well, as we talked about before the midterm, which you've all forgotten because it was on the midterm and we don't remember that anymore, um, that is you can transcribe on both strands. And so you can actually make messenger RNA from either of the two strands. And they're different sequences. So you'll have three open reading frames on this strand and then three open reading frames potentially on the other strand. Yeah? What happens if there's two start codons in the same sequence before there's a stop codon? So what happens if you have two starts before you have a stop? Well, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but if you remember, AUG also codes for methionine. So if you've got an AUG in the middle of a protein, it actually is just going to be encoded as a methionine. So, so for the UUG and GUGs, much less so in the middle. And when we talk about starting and stopping a little bit later, I'm I'm avoiding completely answering your question now because we'll talk more about when we talk about translational initiation later on. It has to do with the tRNA, and there's a specific tRNA that says start tRNA. It's not the same tRNA that's used for elongation. So, yeah, so you can have multiple starts, quote unquote, or AUGs in the middle, but you're only going to have one stop. And so when people talk about an open reading frame, that's one that has a start codon and a stop codon. And just literally by looking at DNA sequence, if you actually find one of those open reading frames, like six open reading frames, that's got a really long stretch without any stop codons, that's actually a pretty good indication that that is your coding piece of DNA. Because if you just think about it, three out of 64, so you know, approximately one in 20, just random nucleotides, it's going to be a stop. So anytime you go much more than 20 without having a stop, it's likely there's some kind of selection that that piece is really important for some proteins. There's a reason there aren't stop codons in that piece. And so literally just by looking for the long bits, again, longer than 20 amino acids, um, and we could go through all the statistics, um, that would be <clears throat> most likely to be a particular coding sequence. So here, for instance, this example, you know, start codon, stop codon, we've actually got less than 20 amino acids here. So if anything, it's most likely actually the plus two reading frame here is part of what your actual protein is likely to be. Any questions on open reading frames? No, okay. So now we'll ask a clicker question that will count because we voted that it would. There are only two nucleotides per codon. How many different amino acids could be encoded by a non-overlapping genetic code? 2, 4, 8, 16, or 32? 
too loud for the people outside. Poor architects. Ten. Five. We're over 80%. Woohoo. We don't have to scuff us up with our neighbors. Um, yes, so four to the n. So you're going to have four squared, 16 if you just had two, which of course is not enough. <clears throat> OK, so <clears throat> we have 64 codons. 61 of them are encoding amino acids. What does the job of? taking those codons and putting in the appropriate amino acids. tRNAs, the transfer RNAs, so the transfer of genetic information from the nucleotide language to the amino acid language. Up here at the 3 prime end is an OH. And again, it's just RNA. So you got a 5 prime phosphate and a 3 prime OH. The 3 prime OH is where the amino acid gets put. So you'll notice it's actually a long way away from the business end down here at the bottom. Um, five prime to three prime. So the five prime end goes around through this sequence, goes through an anti-codon loop, five prime to three prime, which is going to match three prime to five prime. So remember, this is the first nucleotide of the anti-codon is going to match with the last codon of a last nucleotide of your codon. So one thing you may notice here. I. What the heck is I? Inosine. Talked a little bit about inosine before. What the heck is D? D, dehydrouracil. Lots of changes in this RNA. Many, many, many modified bases. Um, on average, about 10% of the bases in any given tRNA have modified nucleotides. Methyl G, dimethyl G, our friend pseudouridine, which is this psi signal as well, and some really wild and crazy ones um, that we'll talk about a little bit more <clears throat> later. tRNAs actually are not always exactly the same length. Um, the major differences in their length is what's called the variable arm, which is right here. But there are some things which are really well conserved. And it turns out that these Ds here, the dihydrouracil, always present in this loop structure in the clover leaf. Um, there's always a T pseudouridine in this part. Um, and so these are sort of what people name them, the D arm and T arm. And most of the base pairs in a tRNA actually base pair with each other. So GC, GC, GU, great thing about RNAs, you can get these funky base pairs, not always Watson and Crick base pairs. But for the most part, these are all base paired with each other. And it's a lot easier to look at these in terms of this cloverleaf structure. Of course, it doesn't really look like a cloverleaf structure. It actually looks much more like an L structure. So what happens in the real three-dimensional structure of a tRNA? You have the T arm and the D arm which actually a loop around and will base pair with each other. So you see these base pairs here at the end of the T-arm are actually base pairing here with these bits that are in the D-arm. And if you look here, most of these nucleotides are paired in some way with each other. So the vast majority of the nucleotides here are paired with each other. You also have these long double-stranded pieces. So a double-stranded piece here, also known as the anti-codon stem, and then the CCA or the acceptor stem on this side. Um, and this L structure, again, the amino acid is hanging out up here, and your anti-codon is down here at the bottom. How do we get tRNAs? Um, they're all made in eukaryotes by RNA polymerase 3. <clears throat> Many, in fact, almost all tRNAs are made as a longer molecule and chopped to be shorter. This should sound really familiar because we already talked about some kinds of RNAs that that happens to, which are the which RNAs? Uh, 
The most common RNA is inside the cell. Right, the ribosomal RNAs are also chopped up. I did hear messenger RNA as well. Um, the three prime end is always cut off on those messenger RNAs. So modification of RNAs is a really pretty classic <coughs> thing that happens to them. So you have modifications not just of the individual bases, but you also have modifications to the original transcript to cut it to be a little shorter. And there are even some cases of tRNA splicing only it's not a spliceosomal process. There actually are enzymes that do that, and this is just an image of those enzymes down here at the bottom where you have splicing, taking a piece out of the tRNA. And my favorite example of tRNA splicing is in some really fascinating organisms, because they're archaea, um, they have tRNAs that actually are made as separate genes. So there are two halves of the tRNA that are made separately and they get spliced together. And people think this may have been sort of an origin of where some of these tRNAs came from in the first place, that they were splicing and mixing and matching with each other. So you have this splicing process. You also have to have tRNA modifications for quality control. And this is just a quick shout out to my colleague in the chemistry department, some of whom uh, some of you know very well, um, Dr. Iwata Royal, he does a lot of work with specific tRNA modifications, not so much splicing, but the individual nucleotides. And we'll look at one example of that a little bit later on. So, but first I wanted to talk about the anti-codon loop, codon loop interaction. So now we've taken that cloverleaf structure and actually flipped it around. So now the five prime is over on this side and the three prime is over here where you have your amino acid. And here, the first position, because we always go from five prime to three prime, of the <coughs> anticodon is a particular nucleotide and then goes through. <coughs> here, it's so the first two nucleotides in your codon. I forgot to mention this in the genetic code, but if you look at the genetic code, the way it's set up again, particularly in that box model, uh, it's the first two nucleotides that are really the most important. And that means is it's the last two nucleotides of the anticodon that are most important. Because those are the ones that can a base pair. And I would say 90 to 95% of the time, these are going to be Watson-Crick base pairs. So G is going to pair with C, and A is going to pair with U. And you're not going to get any kind of funky kinds of base pair interactions. On the other hand, it turns out that you have a lot of cases where the first nucleotide in the anticodon doesn't actually form a normal Watson-Crick base pair with the codon. And this is actually something which Francis Crick came up with well, well, well before we knew the structure of exactly how these things fit together. He and other people had noticed that there actually weren't enough tRNA, tRNA genes, particularly in things like the E. coli genome, and it turns out even in the human genome. There are fewer tRNA genes than there are codons. It's like, how the heck can that work? Well, it only works if you can have tRNAs that will have the same sequence, but can actually interact with multiple different codons. So here's the case for the leucine anticodon UAG, which can base pair with CUA, or CC. Different leucine tRNA, CAG, can pair with CUU or CUC. But then we have our friend isoleucine, which all of you remember, of course, from that tRNA alanine structure that we looked at. The first position of the anticodon, isoleucine can pair with three different other nucleotides, but only when it's in this first position. So I can pair with U, I can pair with C, and I can pair with A. And it turns out that there actually are even some cases where you have four different base pairing interactions that can happen. And Crick called this the wobble hypothesis because it means that you're, so you're wobbling a little bit here. You don't have a normal Watson-Crick uh, base pair, which is happening there. So what is inosine look like? So inosine is over here. Um, I hate the way that they actually use this in the textbook, but it might be the easiest way to remember the structure. 
all of you remember from studying your base pairs for that first midterm, whenever that was, um, that if you had a NH2 group here, this would look exactly like guanine. In the lack of that, and I'm not going to say this, but it's down here, lacking that NH2 group and just having a hydrogen atom here, this is what you have with inosine. So inosine, as we'll see in just a second, can base pair again with the three different kinds of things. But there are lots of other modifications. Remember the D? Dihydrouridine, two hydrogen atoms added here, where there otherwise would be your double bond. Methyl groups can happen all over the place. And then one of my favorite modifications that the Iwata Royal Lab has done a lot of work with is archaeocene that has this really fascinating big modification that happens up here, um, the opposite end of where you would normally find base pairing interactions. This turns out to be important probably for the heat stability of tRNAs that have it. Why is it called archaeocene? Find in archaea. In fact, almost all archaea have this particular modification. People think it's important for thermal stability. Some of our, my lab tried to knock it out completely unsuccessfully. Um, but then some of our colleagues were able to do so. And when they found is the mutant that's lacking archaeocene actually can't grow as well at high temperatures. But I also knocked it out in archaea that grows at normal temperatures. And that archaea said, oh, sure, whatever. So strange kind of question. And we're actually in the process of writing a paper about it right now. So <clears throat> again, one of my favorite tRNA modifications here. Um, but I've mentioned in, in a scene, how do we have <clears throat> Inosine base pairing, inosine, as I mentioned before, can base pair with cytidine, can base with uridine, can base pair with adenosine. Um, and here it's labeled as deaminated adenosine. The reason it's deaminated adenosine here versus deaminated guanine in the previous slide is the biosynthetic process to get to inosine actually goes from adenosine rather than from guanosine. Um, but in terms of thinking about the actual structure, the actual structure again would be you had an NH2 right here, that would be your <coughs> guanine, which would normally find a nice base pair here, Watson Creek base pair, with cytidine. One thing that is a little hard to see here, but if you look where the glycosidic bond is here, so this is what's happened to you, uh, binding up to your ribose, so the one prime position of your ribose, your one prime position of your ribose, it's in a pretty different place here. This uridine is in a different place than the cytidine. Where the adenosine is here is a different place than the inosine. So these are not nice, regular Watson Crick bases. Those bases are really kind of wobbled around, which is where Crick came up with his idea of the wobble hypothesis from, relative to where you'd have your normal Watson Crick kind of base pairing interaction. And again, that's just sort of shown over here. Again, anticodon from 5 prime to 3 prime, codon from 5 prime to 3. At this wobble position, you end up with much less kinds of interactions and also not as neatly aligned interactions. And in the high resolution structures now of ribosomes that we'll look at in a couple of minutes, you can literally see where those interactions are. And the interactions that happen, particularly at that wobble position, are very different than the interactions that you see at the first two positions of the codon and the second two positions of the anticodon. This is how the tRNA interacts with the messenger RNA. But how do you get the appropriate amino acid onto the tRNA in the first place? And that's where we end up with these amino acyl tRNA synthetases. So what does an amino acyl tRNA synthetase do? It puts the right amino acid most of the time. Um, onto the appropriate tRNA. So you would assume that there would be 20 amino acyl tRNA synthetases, or at least 20 amino acyl tRNA synthetases, because those are the ones which are going to be putting each of those 20 amino acids onto the appropriate tRNAs. What people found when they did genome sequencing is that there's actually lots of organisms that don't have 20 amino acyl tRNA synthetases. Some, I think the fewest is actually something like 16 amino acyl tRNA synthetases, which is very bizarre. It's like, how can you get the appropriate amino acid put onto a tRNA 
if you don't have the appropriate amino acid tyranny synthetase. And as we'll see, these amino acid tyranny synthetases also have a bit of a proofreading activity. So one thing to look at here, here's the three prime end of your tRNA in purple. And this is where that amino acid is actually going to get put on. But you'll notice the amino acid tRNA synthetase here in gray also reaches down and basically reads what's present in the anticodon. Because the anticodon here in the tRNA has no idea what amino acid is present up here. And the amino acid here has no idea what's present down here. So it's really this code reader complex of the amino acyl tyranny synthetase which determines how the genetic code is really being read. So to make a long story short, and part of that actually through the studies of John Perona, who's also here in the chemistry department at Portland State, um, they discovered that there were a number of amino acyl tyranny synthetases that can actually put the wrong amino acid onto a tRNA and then there's a separate protein that will come in and modify that amino acid once it's bound to the tRNA. And so this is how you can solve the puzzle of the missing tRNAs, or is it amino acyl tRNA synthetases, I should say. Um, the other thing is if you've only got 20, or in some cases even 16, amino acyl tRNA synthetases, and you've got all of these different RNAs, you're going to have to have amino acyl tRNA synthetases that will recognize multiple different tRNAs. And these are what are called the iso-accepting amino acyl tRNA synthetases because these are tRNAs that are going to have different anticodons down here but still have the same amino acid which is added up here. So this process, adding that amino acid, is also one other thing that amino acyl tRNA synthetases do. And that is <clears throat> activate the tRNA. And so the amino acylation, why do we call it an amino acyl tRNA synthetase? An amino acylation takes a individual amino acid and with the hydrolysis of ATP actually takes the AMP with the energy from removing this pyrophosphate and then the pyrophosphatase that breaks that down, giving you an adenylated amino acid. And all the adenylated amino acid means you have an AMP that's attached to the C terminus of your amino acid. This then gets added to the OH at the three prime end of your tRNA. And all of this happens through the activity of the amino acyl tRNA synthetase. The AMP is released and now you have an activated form. This is a high energy bond between your amino acid and the tRNA. And that's where the energy comes from to get the transpeptidation reaction in order to get translation to take place. So thinking about this, you've really got two different kinds of adapters. You have the tRNA itself, and the tRNA, that's what's going to be interacting with your messenger RNA. But then you have to have the appropriate amino acid which is added to that. And that all comes from these amino acyl tRNA synthetases. So we have a high resolution structure here instead of the model. But again, the important things here, you've got the anticodon loop, and actually also this anticodon stem that's recognized by the amino acyl tRNA synthetase, and the activity putting the appropriate amino acid onto the top here. And this is just another way of looking at that. Here we have amino acyl tRNA synthetase. It recognizes a tRNA, also recognizes a particular amino acid, in this case tryptophan. Reminder, this has got this you know, really funky, humongous structure on it, on the side chain of your amino acid. That gets attached to this high energy bond by the amino acyl tRNA synthetase. Once this tRNA binds to the messenger RNA in the ribosome, now it has brought the activated amino acid to the appropriate place in the ribosome. So process, how do you get your <clears throat> amino acid onto the tRNA? This is also called a charged tRNA because it has the amino acid with this high energy bond associated with it. Just like we saw in replication, sometimes the wrong amino acid gets put onto your tRNA. And you don't want to have the wrong amino acid put on your tRNA. So how do you deal with the wrong amino acid that gets put onto the tRNA by the amino acyl tRNA synthetase? Well, in a manner which is rather analogous to what you see in replication, 
There's proof reading. Now, this is not a backing up of the polymerization, so 5 prime to 3 prime, 3 prime to 5 prime. Uh, it's literally detecting that you have the wrong amino acid attached to your tRNA. And the way that you have a wrong amino acid attached to your tRNA is it once the amino acyl tRNA synthetase has added an amino acid, it basically checks to see if it put on the wrong amino acid. And so this is a different process where it says, you know, if you put on the wrong one, you get rid of it. In the case of replication, you detected that you had some kind of mistake in the structure, and so then you would take out the wrong one. Here, if you've got the right one, you don't take it off. And so that's the process which we have here for the amino acyl tRNA synthetase. If the incorrect amino acid has been added, it gets put into this editing site, gets chopped off. The amino acyl tRNA synthetase tries to add the appropriate amino acid as well. Now, why is this so much of a problem? Because amino acid side chains have a nasty tendency to look really similar to each other. So two examples here, tyrosine and phenylalanine. The difference between tyrosine and phenylalanine is only this O, this oxygen, because of course there's a hydrogen right here as well. So these two guys are extremely similar relative to each other, um, particularly where you would have the activity um, where the amino acid tRNA synthetase adds, which is this um, C prime, let's say C terminus, I should say, not C prime, C terminus. Get used to saying terminus rather than prime now as we're talking about translation. Um, isoleucine and valine, just different by the presence of this one methyl group. So it's that process of the amino acid tRNA synthetase will put on something that's close to the right thing, but if it puts on the wrong one, it'll take that wrong one out. So in the instance of a tyrosine amino acyl tRNA synthetase, sometimes it'll put it on phenylalanine, but it will chop off phenylalanine, keep tyrosine. On the flip side, a phenylalanyl amino acyl tRNA synthetase, we can sometimes put on tyrosine, but cut out the tyrosine if it's not phenylalanine. And this gives you about a, you know, one in a thousand kind of error rate as opposed to one in about, um, if you just had, and you actually literally get rid of the editing sites, it's about one in four or five thousand that end up being put in incorrectly. Yeah? I was wondering, how does it recognize the wrong amino acid, and is it echoing to this activity to pick it up, or what type of activity? Okay, so the way it recognizes, it just literally has this extra pocket back up here, if we can. No, there we go, back up. Um, this editing site has a specific structure, and that structure only is going to be able to bind to the wrong amino acid. So it's got the wrong amino acid. In this case, for instance, you had phenylalanine that's put in, but it should have been tyrosine. Um, it'll be checking for that OH at the end there. If it's the wrong one, it's actually a peptidase, because now we're talking about amino acids and no longer talking about nucleotides. So it's literally the, um, and it's an activity, it's just a hydrolysis will take that off, because the OH that was on the tRNA, they'll then get um, taken off. So this also is, is nice that you reminded me, thank you, is different from what we see in replication in terms of proofreading. Replication, it's something is wrong, I'm going to get rid of that last one. In the case of these amino acyl tRNA synthetases, it's it's this particular one that I know is wrong. So in replication, it's just, it's wrong. Here it's, this is tyrosine, or this is phenylalanine, or whatever it is that's it's incorrect. Whereas again, in replication, it's not specific. It's not specific to guanine, it's not specific to thymine, it's not specific to any of those other ones. Yeah? Any synthetases that have multiple editing sites, so that would be putting in, you know, maybe more than two amino acids and taking them out. As far as we, yeah, checking for two different ones. As far as I know, it's only one very specific one. And so, if you think about it, the the number of amino acids that are really similar to each other, there aren't that many of them. And so, tyrosine and phenylalanine is one pair. Isoleucine and valine is another pair. Otherwise, they're actually there pretty different relative to each other. So it's only going to be those amino acyl tRNA synthetases that have a very similar amino acid to them. Those are the ones that are going to have editing sites. If you have, for instance, I think the glycyl 
amino acyl tyranny synthetase doesn't have much in the way of proofreading activity because there's nothing else that looks like glycine. <laughs> so it's the only thing which is likely to be added in that activity. Okay, so how do we know that A, this is going on, but B, how do we know that the ribosome is clueless? Um, why do we need amino acyl tRNA synthetases? Why don't we just have a tRNA that's permanently hacked up to one particular amino acid? Well, it turns out that what you can do is literally change the amino acid once it's been put onto a tRNA. Not straightforward to do, but not ridiculously hard either. Is you can take, for instance, a cystineal tRNA that's been made by an amino acyl tRNA synthetase. It's got an SH group, and you just reduce that chemically. Now you have alanine instead of cysteine, but actually this alanine is now bound to a cystineal tRNA. If you take this chemically modified RNA and throw it into a ribosome complex like they did when they were taking just the poly U and throwing in all of the nucleotides, you end up with the ribosome adding the wrong amino acid. And you can also flip it around. You can change the anticodon and put on the wrong amino acid. Any of these things, changing the amino acid or changing the anticodon, leaving the amino acid the same, the ribosome has no idea. It's just looking for those base pairs, wobble base pair interactions. So it's really the amino acyl tRNA synthetase, which is determining the genetic code, not the tRNAs. Yeah? So the question is, does this happen um, naturally, or is it something that we've just been able to do? There's usually not too much of this happens in a natural process. This is really much more of an experimental process to show that it really is the amino acyl tRNA synthetase that's doing the job. It's not that the ribosome is doing some kind of extra checking. Um, and that's probably why there is proofreading that happens in the amino acyl tRNA synthetases, because that's where all the business is happening. Once it's done, that's the amino acyl tRNA which is going to be used by the ribosome. Okay, more questions. Ready for another clicker question? <clears throat> so, the <clears throat> post transcriptionally modified nucleotide inosine is present in some tRNAs at which of the following positions? 3' prime out of the codon, 5' prime out of the codon, 3' prime out of the anticodon, 5' prime out of the anticodon, or A and C. Ten, five. This time we do not have consensus, so chat with your neighbors. Like on some exams, I find it useful to literally draw these things out sometimes. Hopefully it makes more sense that way. <clears throat> 
We're happy? Yes? No? Happy enough? Really confused people should have asked them where archaeocene is. Five prime end of the anticodon, because they're always going to be opposite orientation. So the three prime position of your codon is going to be base pairing with the five prime position of the anticodon. Okay, once this has happened, how do you finally put these amino acids together to make a protein? <clears throat> this is the transpeptidation reaction. So you have a tRNA that has an amino acid attached to it, this one here. And then the amino acyl tRNA comes in next to it. This N-terminal group attacks the C-terminal group. You end up with a bond now between this C-terminus and that N-terminus, cutting off this tRNA. And now your growing peptide chain is attached to this amino acyl tRNA, and so on and so forth. And this is how these peptides are made. They're made from N-terminus to C-terminus, and the energy is from this high-energy bond that's attached to the tRNA. So that's the polymerization process, and it's an activated ribonucleoprotein. So our friends, the RNPs again, the R is your RNA, and the P is the protein or the peptide which has been put in together. What does this? What does this is the ribosome. Ribosomes go through a process which actually is extremely similar conceptually to transcription. It has to find the right place to start, which we just said is the start codon, AUG and eukaryotes, AUG, UG, and, C and GUG in a lot of bacteria and some archaea. Once that happens, you have the start codon, which associates with the anticodon of the initiator tRNA, has a methionine on it. And then you have assembly of the larger subunit of the ribosome. Once you have these two together, you start to go through an elongation process, that transpeptidation that I just talked about. The elongation process, you have an amino acyl tRNA that comes in and binds to the ribosome. You have a transpeptidation reaction that happens, and the whole ribosome moves, and you go through this whole process until you finally get to the end, where you have a stop codon, and this peptide is released. As soon as the peptide is released, the whole thing falls apart. So we'll talk about each of those steps um, individually here. Another way of looking at this process is this one, where we have, particularly in bacteria, you have your messenger RNA, the small ribosomal subunit associated with that messenger RNA, gets the initiator tRNA bound to it, then you have the large ribosomal subunit that associates, then you start doing transpeptidation, and the whole process moves, basically the ribosome moves along or the mRNA moves through it, depends on how you think about it, get to a stop codon and everything is released. So we've talked about our messenger RNA ad nauseum, our tRNA, what about the ribosome? Where does the ribosome come into this? So ribosomes are made up of multiple parts. Um, in the prokaryotic ribosome, you have a 30S ribosome and a 50S ribosome. Why the heck do we call them all S's? 
S comes from sedimentation, so where the sedimentation happens in a gradient when you're doing centrifugation. Yeah? Yes, because it's a unit of where you have where it goes in sedimentation. So it's a sedimentation coefficient. And unfortunately, as all of you are really good in math know, 30 plus 50 doesn't equal 70, at least not in my universe. Um, so <laughs> they're not linear in terms of their addition. So where they have centrifuged, and so the small subunit is 30, the large subunit is 50, and together they're 70. Eukaryotes, the small is 40, and the big is 60, and then you have 80 altogether. These are made up of proteins and RNA, but it's really the RNA which is where it's at. So we've already talked about the small subunit RNA, um, the small ribosomal subunit RNA, 16S in prokaryotes, 18S in eukaryotes, the large subunit RNA, 23S in prokaryotes, 28S in eukaryotes, and then these extra RNAs that we're not going to talk about for the rest of the class, um, and then a bunch of proteins. But for the most part, those proteins really are just serving to help the structure. They're really not important in terms of the actual activity. And one way you can see that is if you look at the Crystal structures, which we now have for large subunit, small subunit, actually the whole ribosome all together, um, it's really all about the RNA. Everything that's gray on here is RNA. All of the yellows are proteins, but you notice all those proteins are really around the outside of the ribosome. And where the little green thing is, right in the middle there, that's where the tRNAs are. And you'll notice that there aren't any proteins near there at all. And so really all of the activity of the ribosome is due to the RNA. And as we all remember, uh, the most common RNA that you have in any kind of cell is the ribosomal RNA. And you have millions and sometimes actually even almost as many as billions of these ribosomes in any given cell. So lots of RNA, um, and you need large numbers of them. And just to show you, to finish out where we have um, ribosomal RNA, this is now looking at, again, just the large subunit. Here, just looking at the RNA and one protein. All of these guys are base pairing with each other. They're base pairing with other parts. And it turns out you can actually take these pieces apart and then put them back together as individual RNAs, and you still get the activity of the ribosome. You can get rid of all the proteins, and you still have a little bit of transpeptidation activity from the ribosome. So we'll start with this next slide next time.